trapping anybody in? They try to. We want the world to see. The Schomburg Center held a panel discussion on the war of black bodies. The panel cited recent incidents in Ferguson, Missouri regarding the murder of Michael Brown and the involvement of youth organizing as a response. So two things uh, come up for me. One, this idea of a generational divide, right? Um, and we're not kind of relaying this message from one generation to the next, right? There's also some contention between generations, right? You have, just last week we had a panel, and for, I had, we had some of the civil rights organizers um, in Newark, and they said the young people need to step, step up and not doing anything, right? I have young people saying we are doing things, right? That's one. Two, how do we ensure this history is actually being taught in schools, right? We have educators and school districts that are ambivalent to talk about for, uh, situations like Ferguson in their classrooms, correct? And so how do we... How do we overcome that challenge or that battle, right? And also, how do we address a gener uh, generational divide? Right. We've had generational divides before. We would never have been able to launch a sustained attack on white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And that's what, from 1619, um, when that, those 20 Africans first arrived here and decided they didn't like uh, the nature of their relationship to this, um, those colonies at this point, that has been the consistency in our relationship to this country. We don't necessarily give enough credit to young people. Um, and just because they're organizing in a different way doesn't mean that they're not organizing. And, and that was part of the experience for me in Ferguson. Mm -hmm. When I got there, or when we got there, because it was a, a whole bunch of us that got there, it was very interesting. Uh, one of our comrades gets out of, the, out of the van, and he's like, well, I'm from the Bronx. And the response from the folks, the younger folks that were there were like, oh, at this time, at this time, it was probably one of the first groups that actually got to Ferguson from a community-based perspective. That wasn't necessarily the media. We got there four days after the shooting. And the folks that received us were gang members. The lesson for me, having spent time there talking to these young folk, is this. That we cannot assume that young people don't show up for analysis. Yeah that even if they lack a genealogy, even if they lack the words that we might use and attach to ideas, that they get it. They get it, and if they can't name it, they feel the effects of the traces of white racial supremacy. Mm -hmm. They feel the traces of police um, over-criminalization in their communities. They may not use the word capitalism, but they see how their communities are being depleted by resources. They understand how their bodies are lacking value and commodified in this country. And why they don't use these words, they get it. And people outside of the academic tower and spaces like this get it too. Mm -hmm. So and as it relates to education, I think we have to expand what we imagine education to be. Yes. What about going into the streets and holding conversations there, right? And I watch these young people engage in these conversations using the languages that they know, using cultural cues that they know to say the very same things we're saying right here. Landlords would hike rents in black meccas, that black meccas would become ghost towns filled with empty condos and bodegas, a corner museum of imitation food. That imitation food would become norm to the working poor, that the working poor was just an experiment for survival guides, and survival guides were a nuisance to those whose bias carried them only to the present, but whose death lived, in, lived on, on in wills. What change has come, if only to become caricature to the burden of manifest destiny? What future have we if our sins laid bloodied by fantasy and desire of our own bodies? Whose thesis are we if bodies are made as sacrifice upon surrender? What have we surrendered? Thank you. I think these are things that we need to understand when we're working with young people, that they don't necessarily have the same methods and they don't necessarily work the same way that we did. And we could work with each other, feeding each other, um, but you can't impose nonviolence on a group of folks that is fighting to exist, to live, and that who, like, who have already experienced violence by the system. Let's be clear, the system has a monopoly on violence. The kids weren't the ones throwing tear gas at them. The police was throwing tear gas at them. 
The kids could resist and ask, like I saw in the news, there was a young man in the Bronx that was asking a cop that was searching him, why are you searching me? And he got beat down by six cops because he asked the question. Where are we when these things happen? So they respond the way that they know how to respond. And we can sit here and say, well, they're doing it wrong because that's the way they know how to respond. I tend to look at these things optimistically. That doesn't mean I can't look at them critically. Now, as it pertains to Ferguson, um, there were some generational issues that were there, but what was most important to me, what I found most inspirational, is that in a very short period of time, you could see people teaching themselves the fundamentals of grassroots organizing. Mm -hmm. So the people who were in this community, and these were young people, um, the people who were in this community who knew Michael Brown uh, began saying, we have to have a vigil. And then that vigil became a protest. And then that protest became an uprising. And then that uprising laid the seeds for what's now becoming a movement. Mm -hmm. And this is happening visibly. We can watch this happen. And so I was heartened to see that.